When we hate our enemies, we are giving them power over us, power over our sleep, our appetites, our blood pressure, our health, and our happiness. Our enemies would dance with joy if only they knew how they were worrying us, lacerating us and getting even with us. Our hate is not hurting them, but our hate is turning our own days and nights into a hellish turmoil. Who do you suppose said this, if selfish people tried to take advantage of you, cross them off your list, but don't try to get even. When you try to get even, you hurt yourself more than you hurt the other fellow? Those words sound as if they might have been uttered by some starry-eyed idealist. But they weren't. Those words appeared in a bulletin issued by the police department of Milwaukee, how will trying to get even hurt you? In many ways. According to Life magazine, it may even wreck your health. The chief personality characteristic of persons with hypertension is resentment, said Life. When resentment is chronic, chronic hypertension and heart trouble follow. So you see that when Jesus said, love your enemies, he was not only preaching sound ethics. He was also preaching 20th century medicine. When he said, forgive 70 times 7, Jesus was telling you and me how to keep from having high blood pressure, heart trouble, stomach ulcers, and many other ailments. When Jesus said, love your enemies, he was also telling us how to improve our looks. I know women and so do you whose faces have been wrinkled and hardened by hate and disfigured by resentment. All the beauty treatments in Christendom won't improve their looks half so much as would a heart full of forgiveness, tenderness, and love. Hatred destroys our ability to enjoy even our food. The Bible puts it this way, better is a dinner of herbs where love is, than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Wouldn't our enemies rub their hands with glee if they knew that our hate for them was exhausting us, making us tired and nervous, ruining our looks, giving us heart trouble, and probably shortening our lives? Even if we can't love our enemies, let's at least love ourselves. Let's love ourselves so much that we won't permit our enemies to control our happiness, our health and our looks. As Shakespeare put it, heat not a furnace for your foe so hot that it do singe yourself. We may not be saintly enough to love our enemies, but, for the sake of our own health and happiness, let's at least forgive them and forget them. That is the smart thing to do. To be wronged or robbed, said Confucius, is nothing unless you continue to remember it. I once asked General Eisenhower's son, John, if his father ever nourished resentments. No, he replied, Dad never wastes a minute thinking about people he doesn't like. There is an old saying that a man is a fool who can't be angry, but a man is wise who won't be angry. That was the policy of William J. Gaynor, former mayor of New York. Bitterly denounced by the yellow press, he was shot by a maniac and almost killed. As he lay in the hospital, fighting for his life, he said, every night, I forgive everything and everybody, is that too idealistic? Too much sweetness and light? If so, let's turn for counsel to the great German philosopher, Schopenhauer, author of Studies in Pessimism. He regarded life as a futile and painful adventure. Gloom dripped from him as he walked, yet out of the depths of his despair, Schopenhauer cried, if possible, no animosity should be felt for anyone. I once asked Bernard Baruch, who was the trusted advisor to six presidents, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, Roosevelt, and Truman whether he was ever disturbed by the attacks of his enemies. No man can humiliate me or disturb me, he replied. I won't let him, no one can humiliate or disturb you and me, either unless we let him. But words can never hurt me. Throughout the ages mankind has burned its candles before those Christ-like individuals who bore no malice against their enemies. One sure way to forgive and forget our enemies is to become absorbed in some cause infinitely bigger than ourselves. Then the insults and the enmities we encounter won't matter because we will be oblivious of everything but our cause. As an example, let's take an intensely dramatic event that was about to take place in the Pine Woods of Mississippi back in 1918. A lynching. Lawrence Jones, a colored teacher and preacher, was about to be lynched. It occurred back in the highly emotional days of the First World War. A rumor had spread through central Mississippi that the Germans were arousing the Negroes and inciting them to rebellion. Lawrence Jones, the man who was about to be lynched, was, as I have already said, a Negro himself and was accused of helping to arouse his race to insurrection. A group of white men pausing outside the church had heard Lawrence Jones shouting to his congregation, life is a battle in which every Negro must gird on his armor and fight to survive and succeed, fight, armor, enough. 
Galloping off into the night, these excited young men recruited a mob, returned to the church, put a rope round the preacher, dragged him for a mile up the road, stood him on a heap of faggots, lighted matches, and were ready to hang him and burn him at the same time, when someone shouted, let's make the blankety blank blank talk before he burns. Speech. Speech, Lawrence Jones, standing on the faggots, spoke with a rope around his neck, spoke for his life and his cause. He had been graduated from the University of Iowa in 1907. Upon graduation, he had turned down the offer of a hotel man to set him up in business, and had turned down the offer of a wealthy man to finance his musical education. Why? Because he was on fire with a vision. Reading the story of Booker Washington's life, he had been inspired to devote his own life to educating the poverty-stricken, illiterate members of his race. So he went to the most backward belt he could find in the south a spot 25 miles south of Jackson, Mississippi. Pawning his watch for $1.65, he started his school in the open woods with a stump for a desk. Lawrence Jones told these angry men who were waiting to lynch him of the struggle he had had to educate these unschooled boys and girls and to train them to be good farmers, mechanics, cooks, housekeepers. He told of the white men who had helped him in his struggle to establish Piney Woods Country School white men who had given him land, lumber, and pigs, cows and money, to help him carry on his educational work. When Lawrence Jones was asked afterward if he didn't hate the men who had dragged him up the road to hang him and burn him, he replied that he was too busy with his cause to hate too absorbed in something bigger than himself. I have no time to quarrel, he said, no time for regrets, and no man can force me to stoop low enough to hate him, as Lawrence Jones talked with sincere and moving eloquence as he pleaded, not for himself but his cause, the mob began to soften. Finally, an old Confederate veteran in the crowd said, I believe this boy is telling the truth. I know the white men whose names he has mentioned. He is doing a fine work. We have made a mistake. We ought to help him instead of hang him. Epictetus pointed out 19 centuries ago that we reap what we sow and that somehow fate almost always makes us pay for our malefactions. In the long run, said Epictetus, every man will pay the penalty for his own misdeeds. The man who remembers this will be angry with no one, indignant with no one, revile no one, blame no one, offend no one, hate no one. Probably no other man in American history was ever more denounced and hated and double-crossed than Lincoln. Yet Lincoln, according to Herndon's classic biography, never judged men by his like or dislike for them. If any given act was to be performed, he could understand that his enemy could do it just as well as anyone. If a man had maligned him or been guilty of personal ill-treatment, and was the fittest man for the place, Lincoln would give him that place, just as soon as he would give it to a friend. I do not think he ever removed a man because he was his enemy or because he disliked him, Lincoln was denounced and insulted by some of the very men he had appointed to positions of high power men like McClellan, Seward, Stanton, and Chase. Yet Lincoln believed, according to Herndon, his law partner, that no man was to be eulogized for what he did, or censured for what he did or did not do, because all of us are the children of conditions, of circumstances, of environment, of education, of acquired habits and of heredity molding men as they are and will forever be, perhaps Lincoln was right. If you and I had inherited the same physical, mental, and emotional characteristics that our enemies have inherited, and if life had done to us what it has done to them, we would act exactly as they do. We couldn't possibly do anything else. As Clarence Darrow used to say, to know all is to understand all, and this leaves no room for judgment and condemnation, so instead of hating our enemies, let's pity them and thank God that life has not made us what they are.